Thank you very much. As mentioned, I'm Dan Orchard. I hail from Wetaskiwin, which is uh, just a little south of Edmonton, I guess. And I'm down here speaking um, because I think it's important that you guys understand a little bit about club root, and that's kind of my specialty. It was canola fertility, and I recently made it the transition, so I'm going to still slide in some canola fertility tips. And um, your rep for this area is Autumn, and she's finally back. We're pretty happy that she's back from maternity leave. And she's the stand establishment guru. So I had to throw in a couple of stand establishment slides too, just to uh, make sure Autumn doesn't get upset with me. So my first slide probably I didn't need to put up to tell you guys how dry it was this past year. I think everybody in the audience already knew that. But this is just to verify that uh, it was dry in my area, not just yours. This picture here is of a beautiful crop stand, and obviously this wasn't taken this year. I don't think I came across any fields that really looked this good this year. Um, this was actually seeded at two pounds with a, with a corn planter converted over to seed canola. So I'm not a huge fan of them agronomically because they forego a few things like fertilizer and weed management's difficult. However, I think they have taught us that something happens from the time we dump our bag of canola in the top of our air seeder till it gets to the ground. Um, only 60% of the seeds that we put in the top of our tank actually make a plant, whereas the corn planters seem to be in you know, the 90% range. So. I think there's lots to learn from them. I'm not saying that we need to um, everybody switch over to corn planters by any stretch. This is just a look at how far apart the plants are uniformly spaced in the field. And I have a slide to kind of reiterate how important it is for uniformity. <clears throat> so plant establishment, if, if you kind of start in the top middle, seed placement and depth, and fertilizer placement and equipment and kind of work your way around. I like this exercise because you can kind of give yourself a rating on each of these. Some of them you don't have control over, like environmental things, um, even insect pressure sometimes, but things like depth and trash management and things like that are so important, especially in years like the year we just had. If we get lots of moisture early in the spring, you can just about broadcast your canola and, and it'll, it'll grow. But when years are tough, I think that's when a lot of these little things come into play. When you do the little, little things right, they, they add up on the, on the bad years. Why do we need to target 10 plants per square foot? I think targeting 10 is really important. You, you could probably even target a little higher because the frost and the flea beetles and insects always take a couple of plants and I think you kind of have to just accept the fact that you donate a few plants to mother nature. But if you start at five plants, that, that's what you need to get your full yield potential is five plants. So if you're starting at five and frost takes one or two plants and flea beetles take one or two and you're down to one or two plants, uh, you're unable to reach your, tar your yield target. And if you're around three plants per square foot, not only are you only able to achieve about 90% of your yield goal, there's a big range and variation of yield there. And it's hard to predict and it's hard to, you know, forward sell and contract if you have a big wide range of yield. But when you're at 10 plants per square foot, there's such a narrow yield variation. It's like 10%. So you're going to be hitting 90% of your target to 100% of your target yield just by having those plants. So it's, I, I think it's a quite a, it's not cheap. I know seed is expensive, but that extra pound of seed I think can go a long ways and, and maybe make up for some lost time when, if you're behind a little bit in the spring and have to sp speed up a little bit at seeding time. This is relatively new information, and on the very top, 
the solid red line depicts a uniform high yielding crop. So that's you know 60, 65 bushel crop. The blue line below it is a high yielding, not so uniform crop. And then on the bottom is a, a dashed red line showing a, a uniform low yielding crop and a, a non-uniform low yielding. And you can see that everything kind of, the gap narrows at around five plants per square foot. So uniformity is, is very important. And in my opinion, it's nearly as important as seeding rate. If all your plants are coming up at the same time, it's easy to decide when to spray your herbicide and your fungicide. It's a lot easier to decide when to swath. You don't have to check, you know, nine places in the field. You can just check a couple. Um, so this, I think this graph is pretty important to understand the, you know, the uniformity is, is so key to canola yield. A little bit about fertility. Canola requires about two to three pounds of N per bushel. And I know that's quite a range. I think if you would have asked me two years ago, I would have told you three pounds per bushel, but you know, some of the hybrids are yielding so much higher and they seem to be a little more efficient at picking up nitrogen. So some of the more recent work that was done by Regus Caramanis shows that as your yield goes up, your nitrogen efficiency goes up as well. So that's why there was a little bit of discrepancy between, you know, the two and the three bushel I, um, range that's been thrown around for a few years. I think as you approach 60 bushels, your plants are much more efficient at using nitrogen. So they're only using about two pounds of N per bushel. But, but on the poor crops and the non-uniform crops, um, they require more N per bushel for production. So it's pretty... Pretty interesting finding. Phosphorus, I had a good long talk with Ross McKenzie, who I'm sure most of you know. Um, and Ross is fairly convinced that maybe even 80% of the soil in southern Alberta is deficient in phosphate and would respond to proper placement of, of phosphorus and proper rates. <clears throat> and a red flag should go up when you approach 20 parts per million on your soil test. This will give you an indication that placing a little bit of phosphate with the seed will likely give you a, a response of some sort, whether it be quicker emergence, higher yield, earlier maturity, things like that. And so the critical level was developed by Ross McKenzie through Alberta Ag, a whole bunch of trials and and it agrees with what our message is, um, around 20 parts per million, and you're likely to get a 10% response from that. This slide depicts how, how fertilizer moves in the soil. So on the left side is the nitrogen, and nitrogen is quite mobile. Um, the red dot indicates the prill of nitrogen, and the dark, dark green is high concentration and working to low concentration. So nitrogen, very mobile in the soil. It can move several, several inches. Phosphate in the middle, phosphorus, it hardly moves at all, about an inch from where you put it. And that's after two weeks in the soil. So I think that shows the importance of placement. I'm not a big fan of putting fertilizer with the seed. There's no benefit to doing it with the exception of phosphate if your test is low. So if your soil test is coming back less than 20 parts per million, I think it's recommended to put maybe 20 pounds of actual phosphate with your seed. If your soil test is coming back at 40 or 50 parts per million, there isn't a benefit to be to putting phosphate with your seed. And further that, there isn't a benefit um, to putting anything with your seed, just seed. And you can seed a lot more acres too if you're you know, not filling all sorts of fertilizer with your seed. And, and you know, further to that, at, from a selfish point of view as an agronomist, I don't like to see fertilizer with the seed because it's nearly impossible to diagnose. You just don't have crop emergence coming up, it's uneven. 
Um, you're wondering if you seeded too deep or if the soil's too cold or if the flea beetles or cutworms ate some of your canola. You can't just dig around and, and find the fertilizer and seed touching and, and understand that it's burned. It's very hard to diagnose. <clears throat> this picture shows uh, the red circles being the phosphate and the seed um, being the little dot in the middle. And I know your seeding equipment probably isn't this accurate, but it's just a kind of diagram. And at five pounds of actual P, you can see the spatial variability is such that each seed would not be getting phosphate even at 10 pounds. And as we approach 20 pounds, it's more uniform. And I think that's why the recommendation of 20 pounds of actual P that gives each plant an opportunity to, to find some P. And at about 30 pounds, typically with most drills, that's where you'll start to get injury. Um, canola requires more than this, so putting some with the seed and the rest in a band is, is the preferred, uh, preferred technique. You can see here on soils with low soil test phosphate, there's typically quite a response. Ross wanted me to make sure I mentioned that if your whole field is deficient in phosphate, that's also incredibly hard to diagnose because everything is, at, is behind. It doesn't turn purple like, like you may have read in some articles or something. It's, it's, it's difficult to diagnose a phosphate deficiency. It just slows down the maturity. The plants are just spindly and small and delayed. But if the whole field looks like that, it's difficult to, to compare. Again, just another picture. Potassium, typically not a problem um, on the prairies. We have lots of potassium in the soil. However, you know, eventually we're going to need to replace what we're mining. So there's some areas that are getting a little low. About 150 parts per million or 300 pounds per acre is when you'll start to get a response. That's probably cereals that would resp respond at, at those levels. Canola is uh, a miner of potassium, so you could cut those numbers in half before you'd see a response from canola. But we leave these numbers here because we don't want you to deplete your soil and, and uh, compromise your cereals just, just on behalf of canola. So I think that's a good number to look at, 300 pounds, and if you start getting below that, you're going to need to definitely start adding. Sulfur, it's, uh, it's huge for canola. I've seen a lot of fields where sulfur hasn't been applied and it looks like little sticks without any pods on it and it's not very productive obviously. Um, it is not mobile, so the, the symptoms are on the new growth. However, in this part of the world, you guys would have sulfur in your subsoil. So you may find that you're deficient early and then it, it finds it a little later as the roots explore deeper. Um, so the symptoms will be on the new growth to begin with, but the new growth becomes the old growth eventually. Um, so it can get a little bit confusing and Ross had, had warned me that this happens in this part of the world, so I think it's pretty important for you to soil test at multi-depths, so 0 to 6 and 6 to 12 and even 12 to 24 inches if, if you have the capability. Um, there's some symptoms of sulfur deficiency just cupped and that's often where you will see some purpling, but purpling is just a stress indicator. Small pale flowers are a really good indicator, by then you're getting kind of late uh, to do anything about it. However, you can still rescue canola with sulfur at, at probably at this stage and get a regain a little bit of yield, but the earlier the better for sure. The earlier you recognize the deficiency, the quicker you can get out there. This is a picture of a sulfur deficient plant we grew for uh, an event called Cano Lab, and actually Cano Lab is coming to Lethbridge in February this year, so we're pretty excited. It's like a indoor diagnostic training school, I guess. 
And this plant here was supposed to be deficient in sulfur and you can see the lower half of it, the flowers are pale and, and not bright yellow and then all of a sudden they turn bright yellow. So I had trouble explaining to the class what was happening here until we found out that the janitor had watered our plants at night to try to keep them alive and <laughs> there's some sulfur in the water. So that's the same with your irrigation here would be sulfur there. <clears throat> Okay, a little bit about time of swathing, and, and this is pretty important. We have um, done a lot of work with this, and we're still pushing for this. So 30% seed color change was the old recommendation for swathing, and an extra 8% yield, you know, now by weighting up to 60%, I think that's huge. Um, I think there's going to be even more potential for even later swathing as some of these shatter tolerant varieties come about and, and straight cutting is gaining momentum so we want to just keep hammering this home. This is harvest loss and this is going back a few years now but in Manitoba we have a, a girl that works for the Canola Council um, her name is Angela and she's our harvest loss management expert and she's really passionate about her job and, and she goes around in the fall, you know, checking combines for farmers to see how much they're throwing over and whatnot. And she said she was sitting at her table one day and looked out the window and her dad was just flying up and down the field harvesting her canola. And she thought, you know, I, I've never checked my own dad even for harvest losses. And so she went out there and he was throwing over 13 bushels an acre. And she was, needless to say, a little upset with him. That was her crop, um, and he said, you know, well, it's going 50, like, what do you want? <laughs> you know? so, so she tweaked everything and got it down to two bushel loss, which is a lot more acceptable. Um, she said she doesn't tell that story when her dad's in the audience anymore because he's kind of getting mad about it. But, but at any rate, if you look across the Edmonton, Lacombe, Saskatchewan, Winnipeg, about 6% or 7% yield loss is, is typically what we get. And, and I think that's just too much. I think with some more tweaking, um, we, can, we can get that down to significantly lower. And at that time of year, it's just profit for you, hopefully, coming into the combine. People say that, you know, well, that must have been, that work must have been done on, a, on green combines or red or something, because it doesn't happen with my combine. But, all the, all the manufacturers were tested and they came back kind of all the same in around that 5 or 6% loss at harvest. So it's more the operator. This is, um, you can see all these are plant cells, the, the, bigger, the bigger cells there. And they're supposed to be empty and hollow to transport nutrients and water. You can see these are full of clubroot spores. So this is magnified, you know, a thousand times. Um, and there's millions of spores in one cell, one plant cell. And I think this picture alone kind of indicates the problem that we're having with, with club root and why it spreads so easily. There's just so many spores and they're tiny, tiny little things. So it's um, a so soil-borne disease and sometimes we get complacent. So where um, where I work currently is kind of in the heart of Clubber region. And I'll often we'll see people just associating Clubber with canola. And, and I think it's important to understand it's associated with soil. Canola will propagate it. And canola will be an indicator crop to let you know if you have Clubber. But it, it doesn't spread it. It's the soil that spreads it. So often we'll go to canola tours and put on our booties and hazmat suits and walk through the field and then we come out and take off our boots and everybody runs into the barley field and it's all dirt. It's, you know, it's so, I think it's important not to get too complacent thinking that it's just a canola issue. It, it affects canola but goes wherever soil goes. So we don't get a lot of wind storms like the top right picture anymore but there's still erosion and, and still once in a while on a Sunday you'll wake up and look out your window and think your neighbor's farm is on fire and he's just heavy harrowing. So there's still a lot of soil that's blowing around. 
Here's a picture of a field that didn't get harvested at all. This is in the fall and all the green weeds are coming back um, from the club root that just killed the canola. I, I think I visited about a dozen fields now that didn't get harvested at all. And that's a little hard on the pocketbook. Entrances to fields where bins are is a real hot spot for club root. Typically it's compacted and there's lots of water and nothing really grows very well there anyway. So you can you kind of blame it on that. When, when the crop looks poor there, you don't even check because it, it always looks poor there. Along right-of-ways and low areas <clears throat> is, is typical to find club root. In Manitoba, um, they found a couple fields with club root in the past. Their conditions and environment are such that I think it would explode quite quickly. Uh, well, I think it actually is. Um, so they test the soil, they don't test the plants. In Alberta, we don't call a field positive with club root until the, the plant has club root. In Manitoba, they test the wheat fields and the barley and all their fields. And their lab is capable of detecting at such low, low levels, they're reporting club root kind of right across their province now um, at real low levels in the soil. So not at, levels aren't high enough to cause infection in plants yet, but they know it's there. So some of the pathologists think there's a thin layer of club root, you know, right across the prairies. I'm not sure that's the case, but certainly Manitoba is picking up a lot of uh, positives in their soil samples. So this is a, what their map would look like. The two red areas are where plants actually got symptoms. All the other yellow and orange areas are where it was detected in the soil. This map will be updated here in a couple of weeks and it's gonna be much more colorful. They found 33 more RMs or counties uh, with club root this year, this fall in Manitoba. In Saskatchewan, uh, there's been a couple fields found there, mostly to do with research equipment being transported from Alberta to Saskatchewan and not clean properly. Um, Saskatchewan, I, I tease them that there's a net up at the border and it keeps the rats out of Alberta and it keeps the club root out of Saskatchewan somehow. It's magic um, because they claim not to really have club root. But if you look at the bottom line here, they surveyed 100 fields in all of Saskatchewan and we survey more than, more than that in Leduc alone. You know, so Alberta is surveying. I guess if you don't look, you don't find it. Alberta situation, first found in 2003. I was actually the unfortunate one that got the phone call from the farmer asking what was wrong with his field. Um, so I've been kind of involved ever since. There's over 2,000 fields now. And if you look at the bottom line, uh, up over 10 million spores in a gram of soil. So a gram of soil would be a little bigger than a Smarty. And to think that there can be 10 million or 100 million, even a billion spores in that gram. It's hard to believe there's room left for soil <laughs> after all those spores are there. But so in the, in the greater Edmonton area that there, there is soil with millions of spores in a gram. Whereas you work your way to Manitoba and it's thousands of spores per gram only. So that's a huge difference. It, so. If you were to buy equipment from Edmonton, every gram of soil needs to be removed. If you're to buy equipment from Manitoba, everything the size of a wheelbarrow or bigger needs to be removed. It's the same risk. So don't buy equipment from Edmonton. Um, in 2013, there was a new strain of club root found and this basically revived, revived my club root talks because I think everyone is getting sick of them and now there's some new information to talk about at least. So in, in 2013, this field was seeded to a club root resistant variety and there was fairly large patches of club root out there. So when it was looked into, 
it was a new strain that was found and it was affectionately named 5X and it was called 5X because we don't know what it's actually called so um, we're still looking at classifying it. In 2014 there was 16 fields seeded to club root resistant varieties that showed elevated levels of, of club root. When they were tested uh, in addition to 5X there's nine other strains that we can't identify yet so they're they're new um, it's it's just kind of like taking the, the same vaccination over and over and over again eventually it's not going to work and that's what's happened in the greater Edmonton area they're growing too many crops of canola that are have the same genetic background for resistance to club root and it's it's not working anymore in 2015, just this past fall, 32 new fields were found seeded to club root resistant varieties with significant levels of club root. They haven't officially said that this is a shift of pathotype, but I think we all intuitively know that that's what's happening until they, I guess, do the lab work. Uh, they're not going to confirm that for sure, but I think it's safe to say that there's probably several new strains that will be found again this year and, and many fields um, with this new strain in it. The picture you see here is actually of this field wasn't harvested either. This picture was taken in early July and you can see in the foreground is, is where a garden was years ago. So um, cabbage was seeded in this garden and cabbage brought in the club root and, and the outline of the garden um, the canola doesn't even make it to flower. Everything you kind of see there is alfalfa kind of growing through. And to make a long story short, this field died. The neighbor came and harvested the alfalfa, fed it to his cows, and that we found out club root lives through a cow. So when he spread the manure, unfortunately, he spread club root. Mostly pathotype 3 we have in Alberta, 90% of it. Um, a little bit about research. How am I doing for time here? A couple minutes? Close, good. Um, a bunch of management strategies that have been tested. Things like liming the field, fumigation, bait crops and soil amendments and so forth have been assessed. Boron looked quite promising. Um, other crops can use boron to help control club root, particularly the row crops and cabbage and things. Um, Unfortunately, if you look here, this is a fumigant that was used and this was in the lab, controlled environment, and it pretty much kills the club, eliminates it completely in the lab. The issue is in a, in a controlled pot, you can, you can alter that soil pretty easily and you can soak it with you know, fumigants, but in the field, it's not, not that easy to do. So you can see here in the lab this worked unbelievably well, so it was quite exciting. But once it got to the field, you can see the control on the right and the products really didn't have a very, very much success in the field unfortunately. So it could be something to do with application technique or something like that. These products seem to work, but they're just hard and finicky to make them work properly in the field. This I find even more exciting. Um, this is kind of brand new work. Because boron has such an effect on club root, they thought they would look for some canola varieties that are tolerant to higher levels of boron in the soil. So they went to the seed bank and tested 100 lines and 10 of those lines showed significant tolerance to boron. And if you look at the second and third from the right, um, those particular varieties, you could almost get rid of the club root with the high levels of boron and these varieties were able to tolerate those, those high levels of boron. So I think this is a huge opportunity for the seed industry to start breeding boron tolerance into our canola and we can use a multi-pronged approach to control club root rather than throwing genetics at it every year that are inevitably going to fail. So I think that's a good piece of news and also a recent research that was done 
shows that a two-year break from canola, so, you know, canola and then two other crops, and then canola again, and 90% of the spores are, are gone. You've heard that the half-life is three and a half or four years. I'm not really sure where that came from. I think other countries, but more recent work here in Canada shows that a two-year break from canola and club root spores are are 90 per, 90% gone. So I think asking for a four-year rotation, some growers are having trouble going from a two-year to a four-year, but certainly to a three-year rotation. And I'm convinced a three-year rotation with club root resistant varieties and you'll never ever know you have club root. It's when you tighten up that rotation or use a susceptible variety in an area that has club root and the spore loads build up too high uh, that we can't control it anymore. And that takes me to the end, clubroot.ca if you want some more information or email or call me if you want and I appreciate your attention. Thank you. Thank you.